in our world. Father, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, we lift them up to you. And we ask, Father, that you would send us out, equip us, Lord, and awaken their hearts that they might, too, come to the altar to know you, Jesus. So we welcome you this morning, and we give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Uh, My name is Matt Hartman. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. It's good to have you with us this morning. Hope you're encouraged by your time together with us as we worship the Lord. It's it's great to be together as a family again to worship every Sunday. Uh, If you're new to us this morning, we will also welcome you. We hope you're encouraged here as we gather uh, as you hear from God's word and as you meet maybe some new faces, we encourage you in, in that and welcome you here. Um, you probably walked in this morning and I hope that you grabbed one of these worship guides. On the worship guide, uh, there's lots of great information on what's happening uh, here and opportunities here to jump into our community and begin to serve or grow and maybe probably both of those things, both of those things happen together. Uh, and uh, if you have questions about that or if you have any needs, on the bottom of this worship guide, there's a little tear-off portion where you can put in prayer requests or questions uh, and then drop that off in the boxes out in the hallway. Or uh, there's a welcome desk as well, and we'd love to just get to see you, shake your hand, and uh, hear from you as well. So please, we encourage you to do that this morning. Now, on the worship guide, as I mentioned, there's lots of things that are happening There's just one thing to highlight for you this morning, and that's um, the opportunity to serve, uh, which is a really beautiful thing, is that when we believe in Christ, we get to know Christ, and we want to grow and learn from his word. He says, come, follow me, but then he starts to say, now, go make fishers of men as you're following me. Now, put your hands to the work that I'm about and so we have one of those kind of opportunities. This, uh, after this service and the following services, our group team is going to be hanging out in the cafe, and they're welcoming those of you that are interested in leading small groups, because fall is coming, right? I don't know, this Saturday felt like a fall kind of overcast day, which was beautiful, and it's kind of a sign that, hey, fall is coming, our group ministry is starting to kick up, and we're going to launch that in the fall. Um, and in order to do that, we need group leaders. So if you're interested in serving in that way, if you love creating space for community um, and uh, just facilitating opportunities for folks to grow in their faith and knowledge of Christ, um, we encourage you to step out after this service and visit our group teams that will be hanging out in the hallway or in the cafe this morning. And that is the main announcement for today. So in just a few moments, Pastor David Dwight is going to come up and continue our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. But before he does that, we always leave space in our worship service to extend gratitude and thanks to God through worshiping him through our giving. Um, We are a community of folks that gather to serve Jesus, to communicate our love for him, and one of the ways we express that is giving our all to him, even our tithes and offerings. So if you brought your tithes and offerings this morning and and have it with you in hand, you can drop it off in the wooden boxes out in the hallway, or you can give through uh, uh, online on our app or other purposes or other ways. So we thank you for that. We are excited to be a community that's on mission with him and being able to give our offerings to the Lord in that way. Okay, so... We encourage you to, announcements are done, you can take a deep breath and uh, turn your hearts and attention to the uh, preaching of God's word. It's good to be with you guys this morning.
Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Good morning if you're joining us online or if you are in the lodge today. So we're continuing forward in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I was inviting people, anybody who would like at any time during our summer series to just come spend some time out here in the concourse and sit before this very tall uh, banner that has the Sermon on the Mount uh, Beatitudes written in it. And when I was out there this week, I was reflecting on how high, that's a 20 foot high banner, and I found some significant symmetry in the fact that this is very high and elevated teaching from Jesus. But it's not high and elevated for the purpose of putting us down, it's high and elevated for the purpose of inviting us up into something beautiful and flourishing that is life with God in a beautiful way as Jesus knows it and teaches it. So some of the content today comes like a avalanche of topics, just one after another. And um, I have been told that it's sometimes helpful if I mention that sometimes some content might be PG-13. And that's probably true today. We'll see how that works out. But it's no surprise to any of us that we're living in incredibly confusing times. And so Jesus is going to speak some things that have a kind of clarity to them that I think it's fair to say would land as a real challenge in our broader secular culture. But the church is first a theological organization. Our first interest is to do our very best to render an accurate understanding of who God is. And with the hopefully very humble but very best effort at an accurate understanding of who God is, then so much of the way we live life comes from this. So I've been thinking a good bit about this. And when God is rejected, there is a predictable sequence of effects for human beings. The first one I would say is deception. When God is rejected, deceptive ideas will begin to hold sway. Deceptive ideas about who God is and about who we are. And then deception will lead to distortion. Distortion about who God is and about who we human beings are. And all of that creates a lot of confusion. And then distortion will lead us human beings to depression. And our psyches can only stand distortion to a certain point. And when it becomes substantial enough, we'll experience a pretty profound depression. And ultimately, and sadly, the last one is destruction, as the weight of all of this just becomes too much. So as Jesus is offering the Sermon on the Mount, I believe that his motive is love. The ethic of the sermon is grace and truth, and the intent of the sermon is human flourishing. So he's going to say some things that are going to challenge any of us. As I've read the content today, there are places in my own life that are very straightforwardly challenged by the words of Jesus. But Jesus' straightforward words, as I said, are not for the purpose of putting us down, but they're for the invitation of lifting us up. So, here we have Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. Jesus Christ speaking says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, Raka is a word that he's employing, which basically means call somebody a jerk or say you idiot with a kind of strength of anger behind it. Anyone, again, who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. 
Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It's been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you can't make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, so we're going to open with his first injunction, which is you shall not murder. Every single one of the four main injunctions that Jesus is going to teach about today are for the protection of God and human beings. Now, not God as in he needs to be protected, but for the protection about the truth of understanding who God is. So all four of these are for the protection of God and human beings. And in verse 21 through 24, we start, he says, you shall not murder. Okay, most of us hear that and we say, yeah, I get it, pretty simple. We don't have a lot of gyrations over that. But then what he says is, but I tell you, anyone who's angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment. So now what he's going to do is he's going to tie murderous acts to harbored murderousness in our heart. Now, here's where the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' teaching in general is going to change religion so substantially from what everybody had known to what he's inviting us to. What everybody had known was do the right thing and act the right way, and then you'll be right with God. That's the way people understood religion. When Jesus comes on the scene, what he's saying is any of those outward actions, they're the result of what's inside of our hearts. So Jesus is going to shift religion from outward actions to the very condition, the nature of what's in our hearts. Later on in the sermon, he's going to then go on to say, you know, once he establishes this, he's going to say, now, let's talk about how we've grown to be very adept at being deceptive so that we try to make it look like our actions and our hearts are pure, but they're not. So in a sense, when Jesus starts speaking about the quality of our hearts, the hidden qualities of who we are as human beings, he's going to say, this is the level, the terrain where we live our life with God. It's at the heart level. Actions, we can manage actions for all kinds of impression management. We can be deceptive. We can make ourselves look good on the outside when we know we're not good on the inside. And so Jesus is going to talk about the quality and the nature of what's going on in our hearts. So the first injunction is you shall not murder. But then what he's quickly going to talk about is how anger is connected to murder. Commentators say things like this, murderous actions are the result of murderous hearts. And so Jesus is going to talk about the heart because that's the source of the issue. Now, what Jesus is going to get into in this section very substantially is our relationships with one another. Commentators called this section of the Sermon on the Mount the social section, meaning the relational section, the way our lives and our hearts have social implications and how our lives and our hearts impact our relationships with people, not only like in our families, but even in much broader circles. And last week, I don't know if you had a chance to hear it, but what I was saying is, you know, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount to a huge crowd of people. The sermon is not just to you or to me, it's to human beings. And this is God who is the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, teaching human beings about human flourishing both at the individual level and also at the societal level. 
In other words, we are going to have to learn how to get along with one another harmoniously, with those who are closest to you in your family and your closest relationships, and even with those who are not close to you at all. And so the Sermon on the Mount has implications at all of these levels. It's been said that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of right relationships. That becomes very significant and prevalent woven throughout what's being spoken of in the Sermon on the Mount. And the kingdom of right relationships is the result of the fact that the kingdom of God, as you live it, is first in your heart. It's not first in your actions or first in your external appearances. Okay, so he says, so I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is answerable to the court. So he's tying murder to anger and anger to broken relationships. So anger is a human emotion, and anger is appropriate at certain times in life. When certain things that are dark or unjust are happening, anger is an appropriate response to injustice and to wrongdoing. The question becomes, what will we do with our anger? What will we allow it to become? And here's where the Sermon on the Mount goes into even deeper levels, shifts even into deeper gears. John Chrysostom, one of the great church fathers, said, the one who is never angry is a fool, but so is the one who feeds his anger. And so we're finding these very interactive nuances in these different words. When Jesus says you shall not murder, what he is upholding is the value of human life. And this becomes a very important part of the teaching. In Ephesians 4.26, perhaps you've seen it, but it says, be angry, but do not sin. You've heard various translations on this. In your anger, do not sin, or do not sin in your anger. Interesting assumptions are being made. Anger is going to be part of what wells up within us as human beings. And when there is wrongdoing and injustice, anger is right. It's appropriate. But the question is, what will we do with that anger? <clears throat> now, here comes a really significant piece of it. We human beings have self-control. And this will be a very significant part of the Sermon on the Mount. So we have anger, but a very prevailing presumption of the Sermon on the Mount about human beings is that we have the capacity to override our impulses. We have the capacity as human beings to reflect on what's right and wrong, what's going on inside of us, what's good and what's not good, and to exert self-control for purposes that are higher and more important than our impulses. And this becomes very, very important in our social life and in the Sermon on the Mount. So the kingdom of God is a kingdom of right relationships. Let me tell you about a book that I just finished. It's called The Good Life. And it sounds kind of like an airport beach read, but it's not. It's actually a pretty sophisticated study about what makes for human happiness and flourishing. It is the longest study about human relationships that has tracked human beings through their lives and subsequent generations. That's why it's the longest study. The study started in 1938. It's had four directors of the study. It's been done out of Harvard, and it's called The Good Life. The current directors are a pair of PhD researchers named Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz. And basically, spoiler alert, the entire book that describes the number one thing that leads to human happiness is the quality of our relationships. Not how much money you've got, not all the other stuff that many of us have been taught to chase in our culture. The number one thing this study reveals is that the quality and the happiness of our lives depends on the quality of our relationships. So an interesting quote from Waldinger and Schultz is, they say this, people are terrible at knowing what's good for them. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought they're right. We're just so bad at this. We're not good at discerning what's true and what's not true. We're not good at discerning what's right and what's wrong. We're not good at making the difference between what's popular and what we ought to be doing. We're not good with the wisdom of knowing what's the good life versus what's the social construct that's telling us what's a good life. So they say people are terrible at knowing what's good for them. This study, the longest, most comprehensive study 
from 1938 that's still going on says the quality of our relationships is the number one issue that makes for the happiness in our lives. Okay, so we start by don't murder. We could say, yeah, well, I guess so. We wouldn't murder people because that wouldn't be a quality relationship. Of course, so obvious, but then what he's getting at is anger. And now we're getting into the deeper explorations of our hearts. So he goes on to say, settle matters quickly with a brother or sister. Note the phrasing is a brother or sister. He's starting first with those in the family of God. And basically what he's saying is, you can't tell God you love him while simultaneously hating a brother or sister. And Jesus many times taught things that had very normal family experiences with them. So if you're a parent and one of your children came to you and said, I love you, but I hate my sister, it's not going to work. It's not going to line up in the heart of a mother or a father. And so we begin to see these natural relational constructs that Jesus is calling our attention to. So the first thing that he will speak about is murder, and this is protecting the value of human life. Dale Bruner says, protecting human life is the world's most important service, next only to the protection of the word of God. Jesus' ethic is not heroic in being geared to unusual situations, but in asking for unusual Christians in all the usual situations. Let me read it again because it's a bit of a tongue twister. Protecting human life is the world's most important service, next only to the protection of the word of God. Jesus' ethic is not heroic in being geared to unusual situations, but in asking for unusual Christians in all the usual situations. So, right, the usual situation he's talking about here is just relationships among people who are brothers and sisters in the family of God. That's all normal, very usual. But he's asking us to rise to a level of heart that accords with God's heart. Okay, the next section, because this avalanche of topics comes at us, staccato, one after another, starting in verse 27, he says, You shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. I mean, who ever heard such a thing at that time? Nobody. The idea back then, in a very patriarchal, male-dominated, female-subjugated culture, was men could basically do to or with women whatever they wanted to do. And so when Jesus begins to introduce this teaching, it would have been shocking to men and it would have made women want to stand up and cheer. And so when Jesus says, if you have looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery, probably every man in the crowd was like, well, then I'm sunk, then I'm an adulterer. This is very high teaching. And... Jesus occasionally said to crowds who listen to him, this is for those who have ears to hear. In other words, some will want to pay attention to it and seek to grow toward the beautiful invitation of God in it, and others will dismiss it for any number of reasons. So let's talk about this for a moment. You shall not commit adultery, but whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. Man, I remember being in college talking to all my friends about this topic and this challenge. So many people have struggled with this question. Here we go as human beings. It is a beautiful thing to admire beauty. God has made many, many things beautiful. In the natural world, he's made many beautiful human beings, and it is a beautiful expression of appreciation for God to admire beauty. Okay, let's take it to the next step. You can't not be a human being. If you see a person who you find incredibly attractive, you can't not be a human being. And I'll say it even further, you can't not have hormones, but you can exhibit self-control about what you do in your mind and what you do in your actions. And this is where these ideas of self-control become very, very important. What does it mean then to lustfully look at somebody? Effectively, lust means to make something mine, to do with it what I want. So you can look at a person lustfully, you can look at a car lustfully, you can look at someone's clothes lustfully, but when we're talking about people, something very different is happening. 
a car is an object, and it's okay for it to be an object. Somebody's suit jacket is an object, and it's okay for it to be an object. A human being is not an object, and it is not okay for us to make an object of a human being. God has created every human being with the dignity of his heart and his intentions. For us to try to hijack that and make that person mine for my desire or what I would like to do, this is where we fall into lust. So you can admire beauty, but lusting is something very different. If you look at a beautiful sunset, you might even pull up a chair and sit and look at a beautiful sunset for quite a while, and it will elicit a sense of gratitude and worship in you if you're a believer. But you're not trying to own the sunset. You're not trying to somehow make it yours for your own use as an object that becomes smaller than you. If you see a beautiful person, it would be an act of devotion to God to say, that is a beautiful person. But only you, only you are going to know what's going on in the more subtle layers of your heart, whether you mean that or not. Could you, if you're a woman, see a man and say, that is a really good looking guy. And could you leave it at that admiration or is there more to it? If, if you're a man, could you look at a woman who's beautiful and say, that is a beautiful woman. And could you admire that beauty and leave it at admiration and beauty? She's a daughter of God, or are we going to turn the thoughts into how you want to make her yours and what she would want to do? This is where it becomes lustful, and this is where Jesus is saying that denies God's intention for a human being. Okay, so here we're getting at the heart level, and it gets deeper and even more substantial. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit in us, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of Christ who will give us the heart of Christ and therefore the heart for the things that Christ has a heart for. So in Galatians 5, we read this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So let's stop there for a moment. I've long thought this list is fascinating, but it's a little bit like one of those little kid exercises when you look at a list and it says, which one of these things is not like the others? Like there's this flowery list of Hallmark card words. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And then you get this word self-control. That comes in completely like a curveball that doesn't seem to fit the flowery words that all preceded it. Yes, what the scriptures are telling us is that one mark of the expression of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is alive in me, is self-control. So you and I have the ability to override our impulses, and that's part of what it means to be a human being, and that's part of what God is calling us to do at various times. Let me say it this starkly. When we are behaving more like animals, that is to simply live our lives the way animals live them, to respond to impulses the way animals respond to impulses, to interact with one another the way animals interact with one another, to live sexual lives the way animals live sexual lives, we are diminishing God and we are diminishing human beings and we're diminishing ourselves. So Jesus' teaching of this beautiful high ethic is an invitation for us to come up to this high and beautiful place. So when he talks about lust, he goes on to talk about if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Okay, I remember debating this in college. We were young and so zealous. We're like, does he really mean that? What Jesus is talking about, he is using a very well-known teaching technique, particularly in those times, and it's called um, dramatic hyperbole. And so the point is, what he's saying is, if your eye causes you to lust, pluck it out, he doesn't mean pull your eye out. What he means is, Whatever is causing you to lust, address it and deal with it. So another very significant verse that so interestingly comes right after Ephesians 4.26, don't be angry, I mean, be angry but don't sin. Ephesians 4.27, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold in your life. So what this means is, this is literally like when you have a door and you're trying to close a door, and what the Apostle Paul is saying is the devil's going to try to get his foot in the door and keep you from closing the door. 
And so don't give the devil a foothold. What it means is don't allow any place in your life or in your emotional or internal life that gives the devil room to roam. Now, you will have to know what that means for your life. I will have to know what that means for my life. But some general examples. If internet porn is a problem for you, then do what you need to do to either get filters or get an accountability partner or something like this. There are every single study, secular and religious, on pornography talks about the harm of it in so many different ways. So what he's saying is, if this is a challenge for you, take the steps you need to take to not give the enemy the room to run in your life. Many, many more examples. Okay, so the first one was you shall not murder. This is upholding the value of human life. The next one is you shall not lust. This is upholding the dignity of the human person. And lust is gonna connect to our third one, which is divorce. In verse 31, he says, it's been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Friends, if I had three hours, it would be really hard to translate for you the social cultural norms of that day into today's. Naturally, we would hear this content with today's understanding, and it requires some translating over the centuries. In that scenario, in that day, men had all the power in marriages and women had none. Men could divorce their wives for any reason whatsoever, any reason whatsoever. And then if the man did that, the woman was out on the street destitute, effectively a rejected woman, effectively virtually a leper, and her life was ruined. And so when Jesus is telling men, if you divorce your wife, you have to give her a certificate of divorce, which explains why, and you have to sign it. What he's doing now is bringing responsibility to men, and he's elevating the position of women. Dale Bruner describes it this way. Jesus saw through the sexist strategies of his times, and he returned believers to the original will of God in instituting marriage at all, namely equal dignity and permanent union of one man and one woman in marriage. So what he's doing is he's elevating the position of women dramatically. In any environment, any culture, any society where sexual boundarylessness happens, women will always pay the highest price for this. Women will pay the highest price emotionally. They will pay the highest price on the possibility of pregnancy. And so in any culturally promiscuous environment, women will always pay the highest price for this. So if you care about women, women's rights, women's dignity, I think you would care about this matter. And Jesus in his teaching is dramatically elevating the dignity, the positioning, and the placement of women in the culture. And it was very countercultural and would have earned him incredible amount of wrath from the dominating male forces of his day. So relationships honorable and lasting become the significant question. Okay, let's talk for a moment about marriage and divorce. Of course, there are many divorces, and there is grace for divorce. It's not the unpardonable sin. What Jesus is trying to do is elevate marriage, that the only thing that should break it would be infidelity with somebody outside the marriage. What he's saying effectively is, when that happens, the marriage has been broken. You're only acting on what has actually already happened. Now, the invitations of the scripture would be, if there is any way that you can work this through as a married couple, seeking reconciliation, try, try to do it. But it's understandable that maybe it's not possible. Now, we have many, many more complexities in our day that people would want to talk about, and I appreciate them deeply. Probably the most significant one would be abuse of any number of different kinds. And this would be a very important reason to consider divorce. And I have been with many couples trying to work through the heartache and challenges of this. The main point that Jesus is trying to do is elevate the value of marriage. And in his way of elevating it, he is protecting women from being considered disposable at the hands of men. So some people would say, if the bar is that high, then why would you get married? 
That's a reasonable question, I suppose, as a natural response. So about a year and a half ago, I was in a Zoom conversation with a niece of mine and her fiance. They were getting married and they had asked me if I would do their pre-marriage counseling. Spoiler alert, if you're planning to go into ministry, a whole bunch of your cousins and family members will ask you to do their weddings and this can become quite nuanced in your life. So my niece and her fiance were asking if I would do their pre-marriage counseling. So I asked them this question. I said, why are you getting married? Now, that could be a simple question or it could be a deep question. I think I meant it in both ways. They said, that's a really good question because of all, all of our friends are saying, why would you get married? It's so archaic. Why would you even do that? Why would you even make that kind of a commitment to another person like that? They said, that's a great question. And she said to me, Uncle David, what would you say? I said, you're getting married because you want to know that there's a sacred center to your life. And you want to know that this relationship is not ordinary, it's not disposable, it's not one and try somebody else and that there'll be others in our lives. You're also getting married to display the glory of God. I learned that years ago when a mentor of mine asked me about when I was doing weddings and he said, David, do you ask couples why they're getting married? And I won't tell you the whole long story, but the end game of it was he said, David, they're getting married to display the glory of God. I said, say more about that. He said, marriage has a theological center. When God created human beings, male and female, and they choose to join their lives together, what they're doing is showing the world what God's love looks like so that when people see the way a married couple love each other, they would have an understanding of the way God loves us. So when we get married, we're getting married to display the glory of God. And all of a sudden, this vision and this invitation of what it means to be married is beautiful and incredible. Marriage isn't for everybody. It won't be for everybody for a host of different reasons. But what Jesus is doing is lifting the vision of it. I can see the time, so let me close on the last part. Jesus says to them, you've heard it said that people long ago got into oaths, and what he's saying is, when you make an oath, don't go into all this rigmarole, just let your yes be your yes and a no be a no. People were saying foolish religious things like, cross my heart and hope to die, I swear to God on a stack of Bibles by the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus was like, stop it. Stop this religious ridiculousness. Say yes and say no, and mean whichever one you say. And let's not keep piling up this ridiculous religion. Somebody would say, I swear on a stack of Bibles. Well, how many are in the stack? Six. Well, what's wrong with five? Can you do it on five? Would one be enough? How about three? You see Jesus just saying, stop the ridiculous religion and just make your yes be a yes and your no be a no. The section of the sermon here is about the value of human life, the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of marriage, and the integrity of promises. Four main points. And all four of these hold each other up like the four legs of a table. And if one is missing in life in general, yes, in our personal lives, but in social life in general, if one is missing, the table will fall down. So back during COVID, there were what were called COVID police free zones. The idea was a picture that we're just going to be able to create life without any interference, any God, any authority, any anything. They lasted about one or two months until life in the COVID free zones completely fell apart on abuse, power mongering, murders, rape, and all kinds of other difficulties. When Jesus is giving us this invitation in the Sermon on the Mount, He's inviting us into God's intended design for human flourishing. So let's pray together and we'll come to the communion table and finish our time. Lord God, we come to you today and we ask you to move in our hearts. I think of the prayer that says, our hearts are open before you and everything is known. All desires are known and no secrets are hid. Father, Mostly what we want to do is come to you in the grace of Jesus with so much gratitude that you've called us your own children. And now, Lord, as we come to the communion table, we take a moment just to pray and reflect and speak to you.
Lord Jesus, as we come to the table, we bring to you our failures and our sins. We bring to you the things we harbor in our hearts. We bring to you the places that are not healthy, that are not whole, even that are dark. And we ask for you to shine the full light of your healing presence in our lives. We are so grateful to you that your grace is sufficient for us. There is no place, no thing, no thought, no action in our lives that is too big for your grace, and we thank you. Lord, we pray for one another as we wander through this barren landscape of our day.